BenQ is back at it again with one of their Mobius monitors. If you're not familiar with what a Mobius is, it's basically one of BenQ's lineup of monitors where they add lots of features into one monitor, making it a do-it-all monitor for a particular class. In this case, the 1440p 240Hz segment. I'll tell you everything you need to know about the BenQ Mobius EX270QM, I'll compare it to other similar monitors and tell you if it's worth getting or not. First, let's go over those extra features that makes this a Mobius. There are some useful and not so useful features. Some of the useful ones are included in BenQ's iCare feature suite, which has an auto brightness sensor, which is great if you have ambient light that constantly changes, or you just don't feel like changing the brightness yourself when the sun goes down. Having the brightness set to something that's suitable for a certain ambient brightness level is good because it relieves eye strain and headaches. And since you don't have to do anything for the brightness to change, that makes things even better. It works well on this monitor and always adjusts to a brightness level that my eyes and brain are happy with, so good stuff here. Another feature is the blue light filter, which personally I never use on any monitor, but I'm sure some of you out there do. Now, you might be saying, well, Bijan, these are things that many other monitors include. So what? Well, I'm not done just yet. Relax. Because it also includes an e-paper option, which turns everything black and white if you want this to be a giant Kindle. It has a color weakness mode to filter red or green colors in case you're colorblind. And it has speakers, which is personally my favorite feature on Mobius monitors. They're integrated into the back of the monitor and to the chin, and kind of makes the chin a little bit fat, but they're good. They get decently loud and don't have any distortion. The audio is clear. They have different sound profiles in case you like one more than the other. And they don't add clutter to your desk, which is a bonus for me. Now they're not the best speakers in the world. They won't give you an immersive soundstage and feel despite what the marketing says, but they're better than just about any other monitor with built-in speakers and they'll get the job done just fine. They're particularly useful when I don't feel like putting my headset on or if I just want to quickly show my wife something and don't feel like taking my headset off to give to her, then put them back on when I'm done showing her whatever it is I was showing her. Lastly for the useful features is the remote, which controls the speaker volume, screen brightness, your sound profiles, HDRI settings, we'll get to that in literally a few seconds, and the rest of the OSD. Now, a not so useful feature that BenQ has been including in pretty much all of their monitors is the aforementioned HDRI or HDR intelligence. Despite what BenQ says on their marketing about how big of a deal HDRI is, it's just not. It's basically regular bad HDR with some software to try to enhance the experience. Keyword, try. If you constantly switch it on and off, you can notice a difference. It's not like there isn't one, but it's not a difference that's gonna make you go, wow. What it ends up doing is dimming the brightness completely, making dark parts even harder and sometimes impossible to see, just to make the bright parts seem brighter than they actually are. Now it does a little more than that, but since it's limiting overall brightness and it doesn't have any special backlight for great local dimming, it's just not good. And it's doing the exact opposite of what HDR is supposed to do. And after experiencing real HDR for the last few months with the Alienware QD OLED Ultrawide and the Samsung QD OLED TV, this doesn't come close. I'm not saying it's bad because it's not OLED and it can't compete with OLED. I'm just saying it's bad because it's bad. And the same applies to pretty much every other monitor in this class and price range. For example, the monitors I'm comparing this to in this video are the Alienware AW2721D, the ASUS ROG Strix XG278QM, and the LG 32GQ850, all of which are 1440p, 240Hz. And their HDR all sucks too. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. If you're looking for good HDR, it doesn't matter if it's for gaming or media consumption, you need something with the proper hardware to be able to provide that experience. Fortunately for BenQ, the gaming aspect of the monitor is good, which is kind of important for a gaming monitor. The input lag is very low at four milliseconds, but it's the highest one of the bunch with the other monitors being anywhere between two and three milliseconds. Now that difference is negligible, so I'm not really worried about it. They all feel just as instant as each other and you will not feel that difference. I know some people get caught up on the input lag figure saying a monitor is bad just because it's one millisecond slower than another. And if we're talking about the whole peripheral stack, adding a few milliseconds here and there between multiple peripherals and other hardware will start to be a problem. But if you optimized your setup with the lowest latency stuff imaginable, or you're coming from a 60 Hertz or 144 Hertz to 240 Hertz monitor, you're totally fine and you're gonna love it. 
The response times are also good for this class of monitor. There are four settings, and I wouldn't even bother with the third and fourth one because the overshoot is just no bueno. The best setting at 240Hz is the second setting, which is actually labeled AMA1, not 2. This setting gives the best balance between lowest pixel response times without introducing really any overshoots. And when we compare it to the other monitors, most of them perform about the same, minus the Alienware, which somehow has overshoot at the lowest setting. Now, when it comes to data, I only have response time data for the Mobius and LG, not for the Asus and Alienware since the OSRTT response time tool became available after I reviewed those, and I don't have those monitors anymore. But you can clearly see in this comparison that the Alienware has overshoot, the Mobius does well, and the Asus and LG are just slightly better than the Mobius. Although the LG has a slight advantage being at 260 hertz. And while you could make the argument that I should make this test fair by putting everything at 240 hertz, the fact of the matter is that anyone getting the LG is going to be putting it at 260 hertz, not 240 hertz. Plus, 20 hertz really isn't going to skew the results one way or another in a meaningful way, and giving the Mobius an extra 20 hertz won't help it catch up to the dark gray performance that the LG has, which does noticeably better. At the end of the day though, these are just numbers and most people watching will probably not know how to read response time charts and what they actually mean. Basically, it means that you likely won't notice much of a difference between these monitors. I might be able to tell the difference if I had the Mobius, Asus, and LG side by side looking for a difference, but when gaming, it's much harder to notice, especially when you're in the thick of it. They all perform great, even the Alienware with its slight overshoot, though I wouldn't choose it over the others simply because there's not a single setting without overshoot, and the lower the frame rates get, the more pronounced it is. Speaking of which, at 144 hertz, you start to see the Alienware fall apart, again, even with the overdrive turned down as low as a monitor allows. And it's not totally unreasonable to be playing at this refresh rate, especially at this resolution. For example, I have an RTX 3080 and a Ryzen 9 5950X, and my PC hovers around 120 FPS in Tarkov and 180 FPS in the new Modern Warfare 2. And that's with competitive settings. And while 120 and 180 FPS isn't 144 FPS, you can get an idea of how a monitor will scale based on the frame rates and the response times and overshoot performance of the Dell is not competitive. Now you'd likely still be happy owning the Dell, I'm not saying you should avoid it like the plague, but if you're like me and you're looking for better, the Mobius, Asus, and LG are just that. Now another thing that this Mobius has is black frame insertion. For those not familiar with BFI, it's a feature to help reduce blur, but not in the same way that overdrive reduces trailing. In this case, it lowers the persistence of the image for each frame by inserting a black frame, hence the name black frame insertion, in between frames to lower the persistence of the image you're seeing. This is useful because it helps your brain process fast motion scenes easier since the image is clearer. The Mobius and Asus have it, but the Alienware and LG doesn't, and it's obvious which two monitors perform best and which two perform the worst. It even works at 144Hz and even 120Hz, so you don't really have to worry if your PC doesn't run games at 200fps all the time. So, if you want the best motion clarity, you'll want the Mobius or Asus. Although the Asus does slightly better at 240Hz because it has less crosstalk, or trailing as most people may refer to it as, but the Mobius does better at 144Hz because it doesn't overshoot, which is great for the Mobius because that means it's more consistent with its results throughout the entire black frame insertion refresh range. It's also much brighter than the Asus, having 57% more brightness, which is kinda nuts. But this doesn't really surprise me because BenQ is known for putting overkill backlights on their monitor for blur reduction technology. So between these four monitors, the Mobius and Asus have the best motion clarity, with the Asus having marginally better clarity, but the Mobius having much better brightness and consistency with its black frame insertion. Really, the difference in clarity isn't noticeable because it's so marginal, but the brightness difference is very noticeable, so personally, I'd go with the Mobius. Now, if you don't care that the Asus is limited to 160 nits with black frame insertion, then get that because better clarity is better clarity. One thing's for sure though, the LG can't compete because it has no black frame insertion, and neither can the Alienware because of the same reason, but also because of overshoot everywhere. Now, in terms of software features like the black equalizer and color vibrance, 
the Mobius and Asus do the best yet again, with the Asus doing better in Color Vibrance and the Mobius doing better in the Black Equalizer. Though this is, again, kind of a marginal victory for both in this aspect. The dark areas are just a little bit less dark on the Mobius, which means dark enemies won't blend in with dark spots of the map as easily. The LG did okay, but didn't do as well as the Mobius or Asus. And the Alienware barely did anything. Having a good black equalizer and color vibrance is, in my opinion, very important, especially in competitive titles. In games like Valorant, it doesn't really mean much because the game's already so bright, vibrant, and saturated. But CSGO is quite flat, and because that game has over 1 million concurrent players every single day for the past six months, I bet quite a few of you are looking for as much of an edge as possible, and a good black equalizer and color vibrance without any software that can lower frame rates will help. So this new Mobius does well against the LG and Dell, but I'll be honest, I did not expect the Asus to put up as much of a fight, especially because this Mobius came out a whole year after the Asus. Overall though, when it comes to gaming, all of these are good. If you're looking for the best response times, you'll want the Mobius, Asus, or LG. If you want to take image clarity even further with black frame insertion, you'll want the Mobius or Asus. Input lag between them was pretty much the same, plus or minus one or two milliseconds, so I wouldn't really worry about that. And if you want the best black equalizer and color vibrance, again, that'll be the Mobius or Asus, with the LG being right behind them. Personally, I think it's a tie between the Mobius and Asus overall so far. I wanted to include the LG to make it a three-way tie, but it doesn't have black frame insertion and it only comes in a 32 inch version, which is kind of a problem. 1440p at 32 inches does not have the best pixel density. It's not bad, but it's not great. I'm not sure who at LG thought not including a 27 option was a good idea, but it's not. Lastly, we have the Alienware. It's still a good monitor. It's just there'll be no point in getting it because these three other monitors exist, unless you find a really good price on it. If you do, then do whatever. Now, another thing that you might also be using these monitors for is media consumption and content creation. And all of these are great. Disclaimer, I didn't have Portrait Kalman Ultimate when I reviewed the Alienware. So I don't have anywhere near as much data for that monitor as I do with the Mobius, Asus, and LG, but it'll likely still perform pretty similar. They all have wide gamut support, having about 94 to 95% coverage of the DCI-P3 color space. This means that colors will look more saturated than the standard sRGB monitor, since these are P3 panels. The Mobius and LG have decent Adobe RGB coverage, but the Asus blows them out of the water with practically full coverage. You photo editors out there will love this. In terms of color accuracy, the Mobius had the best color accuracy out of the box with an average Delta E of 2.8, but there's this common issue I've had with all Mobius monitors where calibrating it doesn't really help as much as it does for other monitors. You can see that in this chart where the Mobius does better than it did without the calibration, but not by much, whereas the Asus and LG performed spectacularly. And while the Mobius doesn't do as good as the Asus and LG, 2.14 is still very accurate, and if your profession isn't to look for color inaccuracies and correct them, you won't notice it. The Mobius also has the best grayscale performance out of the box by a wide margin, maintaining a pretty gray gray. The Asus has a cyan tint to its grays, the LG has a slight purple tint, and calibrating the monitor fixed all inaccuracies. The Mobius also has the best uniformity by far, hammering down the point that it's the monitor to get between the three if you want the best out of the box colors, grayscale, uniformity, etc. Now sure, you can get the LG, Asus, or Alienware and calibrate it, and those would do better, except for the uniformity. You can't fix that. But most people buying monitors aren't going to be paying an extra few hundred bucks for hardware to calibrate their monitor. And no, you can't buy a colorimeter, use it, and return it. Monitors need to be recalibrated at least once a month because the colors will shift over time. Either way, whether you're stuck with the default performance of the Asus, the LG, or the Mobius, they all look very good. Even a Delta E of around six is still pretty decent despite what a lot of people say. It's usually when you get to around like eight, nine, 10 where it starts to get noticeable, but anything five-ish or lower is pretty good. And when it comes to consuming media on these monitors, it's just great. Now, if you're not familiar with a P3 display, it's just much better in my opinion than using a standard sRGB monitor because again, colors are more saturated and it makes for a nice viewing experience. It's kind of like going to Best Buy and seeing the display TVs and kind of how saturated they are. Just imagine those 
but in your house on your desk. Now, before we conclude, there are a few more things this Mobius has, such as the 100 by 100 VESA mounting support. It has a nice wire routing hole, which isn't visible unless you're JDM. And it's got a nice assortment of IO supporting anything and everything your heart desires. All right, so the Mobius is a very good 1440p, 240 hertz monitor. Not just because I'm saying it, but because the data shows it. But is it worth the $800 that it costs? Well, that depends on what you want. BenQ likes to distinguish themselves from other brands by having lots of features in one package instead of being just another panel with a body holding it. But it's not just about the features because it also performs great. And I'd say it's the best one out of all of them here because it has the best combination of great response times, good black frame insertion tech with high brightness, a great black equalizer and color vibrance combo, and the best out of the box color performance, which is a good thing for most buyers. And if all that's worth the extra $150 to $250, depending on what you compare this to, then this is perfect for you. But if you don't care about all that stuff, then I'd say the Asus is more suited for you. It really just depends on what you want in a monitor. And let's be real, price is always going to play a role no matter what you buy anyways. But yeah, so far this is the best 1440p, 240Hz monitor I've reviewed, and I recommend it. Thanks for watching, like, dislike, comment, follow my Twitter, join my Discord, and have a great day every day. Peace.